weight controversial? The 1973 Supreme Court decision in the case of Roe v. Wade legalized abortion in the United States and has probably engendered more public controversy than any other legal decision of the late 20th century. Women's access to safe abortion continues to be the subject of debate. At issue in legal cases, and has inspired overzealous anti-abortion activists to violence. Against doctors who perform abortions and office workers in women's health clinics. The seven Supreme Court justices who issued the majority decision became the recipients of thousands of letters of hatred, some of them threatening. The case was brought as a class action suit, representing all pregnant women. By 21-year-old Norma McCorvey, 1947. Who has since the ruling reversed her feeling and joined the anti-abortion camp as a right to life advocate. But in 1969, under the alias Jane Roe, McCorvey claimed that Texas's abortion law on the books since 1859, violated her constitutional rights and those of other women. The other party named in the case was Texas District Attorney Henry B. Wade, 1914-2001, who argued to uphold Texas state law that punished anyone who gave an abortion. Despite the fact that the ruling in the case would do nothing to help McCorvey for whom even a favorable decision would come too late to end her unwanted pregnancy, her lawyers, Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington, agreed to pursue the case as a test. The crux of the plaintiff's case is best summed up by arguments made before the Supreme Court, when in December 1971, Weddington argued that Texas's ability to compel women to bear children infringed on a woman's right to control her own life. It was therefore a violation of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, which forbids states to make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens. In response to defense claims that the fetus is entitled to protection, Weddington averred. The Constitution as I read it, attaches protection to the person at the time of birth. These arguments, and those of the defense, were presented twice to the Supreme Court. After the first presentation the seven justices then seated concluded that such an important Decision should not be made until the two newly appointed justices could participate. In October 1972 the case was heard again. As it turned out, the two new judges represented one majority vote and one dissenting vote. The majority decision was read by Justice Harry Blackman on January 22, 1973. The High Court overturned all state laws restricting women's access to abortions. The decision was based on the court's opinion that existing laws banning abortions had been enacted to protect the health of American women, since abortion had previously been a risky medical procedure. And that with advances in medicine this protection was no longer necessary or valid. The court also agreed that the Constitution's implied right to privacy, as found in the Fourteenth Amendment's concept of personal liberty, or in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision to terminate her pregnancy. 
Two justices dissented in the opinion, with Justice Byron White writing that the court had sustained a position that values the convenience. Whim or caprice of the putative mother more than life or the potential life of the fetus. Nearly three decades after the landmark decision, opinion continues to divide along such lines. Wade controversial. The 1973 Supreme Court decision in the case of Roe v. Wade legalized abortion in the United States and has probably engendered more public controversy than any other legal decision of the late 20th century. Women's access to safe abortion continues to be the subject of debate. At issue in legal cases, and has inspired overzealous anti-abortion activists to violence. Against doctors who perform abortions and office workers in women's health clinics. The seven Supreme Court justices who issued the majority decision became the recipients of thousands of letters of hatred, some of them threatening. The case was brought as a class action suit, representing all pregnant women. By 21-year-old Norma McCorvey, 1947, who has since the ruling reversed her feeling and joined the anti-abortion camp as a right-to-life advocate. But in 1969, under the alias Jane Roe, McCorvey claimed that Texas's abortion law on the books since 1859, violated her constitutional rights and those of other women. The other party named in the case was Texas District Attorney Henry B. Wade, 1914-2001 who argued to uphold Texas state law that punished anyone who gave an abortion. Despite the fact that the ruling in the case would do nothing to help McCorvey, for whom even a favorable decision would come too late to end her unwanted pregnancy, her lawyers, Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington, agreed to pursue the case as a test. The crux of the plaintiff's case is best summed, up by arguments made before the Supreme Court, when in December 1971, Weddington argued that Texas's ability to compel women to bear children infringed on a woman's right to control her own life. It was therefore a violation of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment which forbids states to make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens. In response to defense claims that the fetus is entitled to protection, Weddington averred. The Constitution as I read it, attaches protection to the person at the time of birth. These arguments, and those of the defense, were presented twice to the Supreme Court. After the first presentation the seven justices then seated concluded that such an important decision should not be made until the two newly appointed justices could participate. In October 1972 the case was heard again. As it turned out, the two new judges represented one majority vote and one dissenting vote. The majority decision was read by Justice Harry Blackman on January 22, 1973. The High Court overturned all state laws restricting women's access to abortions. The decision was based on the court's opinion that existing laws banning abortions had been 
enacted to protect the health of American women, since abortion had previously been a risky medical procedure. And that with advances in medicine this protection was no longer necessary or valid. The court also agreed that the Constitution's implied right to privacy. As found in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty, or in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people. Is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision to terminate her pregnancy. Two justices dissented in the opinion, with Justice Byron White writing that. The court had sustained a position that values the convenience. Whim or caprice of the putative mother more than life or the potential life of the fetus. Nearly three decades after the landmark decision, opinion continues to divide along such lines. What was Abscom? Abscom was an undercover operation conducted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI, to ferret out corrupt government officials and prosecute them. In 1978 agents began posing as American representatives of Arab businessmen whose company The fictitious Abdul Enterprises Limited, was willing to buy political influence in the United States. Abscom comes from the first two letters of the business name, with the word scam added to the end. The trap was set. The first to be caught was Congressman Michael Ozzie Myers. 1943, a Pennsylvania, who was videotaped accepting a $50,000 bribe and saying, I'm going to tell you something real simple and short money talks in this business. Other officials also fell prey to the sting operation. All of them were arrested on charges of bribery and conspiracy. The first of seven trials got underway in 1980. None of the officials were acquitted. Most faced fines and slash or imprisonment, and all of them lost their offices. The wide net cast by Abscom had caught one U.S. Senator, six representatives in Congress. One mayor, three members of the Philadelphia City Council, one INS. Immigration and Naturalization Service, inspector, one lawyer, one accountant, and many of their associates. The FBI operation and the resulting trials and punishments sent a loud warning to any public official subject to influence. What was Abscom? Abscom was an undercover operation conducted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. FBI, to ferret out corrupt government officials and prosecute them. In 1978 agents began posing as American representatives of Arab businessmen whose company. The fictitious Abdul Enterprises Limited, was willing to buy political influence in the United States. Abscom comes from the first two letters of the business name, with the word scam added to the end. The trap was set. The first to be caught was Congressman Michael Ozzie Myers. 1943, a Pennsylvania, who was videotaped accepting a $50,000 bribe and saying, I'm going to tell you something real simple and short money talks in this business. 
other officials also fell prey to the sting operation. All of them were arrested on charges of bribery and conspiracy. The first of seven trials got underway in 1980. None of the officials were acquitted. Most faced fines and slash or imprisonment, and all of them lost their offices. The wide net cast by Abscombe had caught one U.S. senator, six representatives in Congress. One mayor, three members of the Philadelphia City Council, one INS. Immigration and Naturalization Service, inspector, one lawyer, one accountant, and many of their associates. The FBI operation and the resulting trials and punishments sent a loud warning to any public official subject to influence. What was the gang of four? The gang of four was a group within China's Communist Party that, under the leadership of Mao Zedong's wife, Zhang Qing, 1914-1991, 21 years his junior, carried out its own power-hungry agenda and plotted the takeover of the government from Chairman Mao, 1893-1976. A former stage and movie actress, Zhang was also an astute student of politics. In the late 1960s, at which time she had been married to Mao for some 30 years. She became associated with former army commander Lin Bao, and the pair conspired to stage a coup. In 1970, at a Communist Party conference, they announced that Lin had surpassed Mao as the leader of the people. One year later Lin and Zhang tried to overthrow Mao's government. Failing, Lin fled the country, his plane was later shot down. And Zhang succeeded in covering up her involvement in the affair. But she continued her subversive activities, associating with three other members of the Politburo. The Chief Executive and Political Committee of the Communist Party In 1974 Mao publicly admonished his wife and her cohorts, Wang Hongwen, Yao Wenaiyuan, and Zhang Chunkyo, to cease their power-seeking activities. Infighting in the party had already resulted in Mao's loss of influence. Two years later, on September 9, 1976, Mao died. The gang of four were arrested and thrown into prison. There they remained for years while the case against them was formulated. Resulting in an indictment that consisted of 20,000 words. Finally, on November 20, 1980, the Gang of Four, expanded to include six other conspirators, were put on trial charged with counter-revolutionary acts including sedition and conspiracy to overthrow the government. Persecution of party and state leaders, suppression of the people, and plotting to assassinate Mao. During nearly six weeks of testimony, Jiang's machinations were revealed to the 600 representatives who attended the trial, held in an Air Force auditorium in western Beijing. As well as to the Chinese press, foreign press was prohibited from attending. Her laundry list of malicious acts as ringleader of the Gang of Four included public humiliation and even torture of Communist Party rivals, execution of her personal enemies. 
inspiring the fear of the masses, and purging the arts of anything that did not carry a revolutionary theme. Zhang, while not denying many of these acts, insisted that she had all along acted at the behest of her husband, Mao. During the explosive testimony and presentation of evidence, which included tapes and documents, substantiating the state's case against Zhang, she made outbursts, was temporarily expelled from the courtroom, was dragged screaming from the courtroom twice, and even taunted her accusers into executing her, saying it would be more glorious to have my head chopped off. In the end Zhang and one other conspirator were found guilty and sentenced to death. Later commuted to life in prison. And the eight others were also found guilty and charged with sentences ranging from 16 years to life in prison. Zhang died on May 14, 1991, in what appeared to be a suicide. What was the gang of four? The gang of four was a group within China's Communist Party that, under the leadership of Mao Zedong's wife, Zhang Qing, 1914 to 1991, 21 years his junior, carried out its own power-hungry agenda and plotted the takeover of the government from Chairman Mao, 1893 to 1976. A former stage and movie actress, Zhang was also an astute student of politics. In the late 1960s, at which time she had been married to Mao for some 30 years. She became associated with former army commander Lin Bao, and the pair conspired to stage a coup. In 1970, at a Communist Party conference, they announced that Lin had surpassed Mao as the leader of the people. One year later Lin and Zhang tried to overthrow Mao's government. Failing, Lin fled the country, his plane was later shot down. And Zhang succeeded in covering up her involvement in the affair. But she continued her subversive activities, associating with three other members of the Politburo. The chief executive and political committee of the Communist Party. In 1974 Mao publicly admonished his wife and her cohorts, Wang Hongwen, Yao Wenai Yuan, and Zhang Chunkyo, to cease their power-seeking activities. Infighting in the party had already resulted in Mao's loss of influence. Two years later, on September 9, 1976, Mao died. The gang of four were arrested and thrown into prison. There they remained for years while the case against them was formulated. Resulting in an indictment that consisted of 20,000 words. Finally, on November 20, 1980, the gang of four, expanded to include six other conspirators were put on trial charged with counter-revolutionary acts, including sedition and conspiracy to overthrow the government. Persecution of party and state leaders, suppression of the people, and plotting to assassinate Mao. During nearly six weeks of testimony, Jiang's machinations were revealed to the 600 representatives who attended the trial, held in an Air Force auditorium in western Beijing. As well as to the Chinese press, foreign press was prohibited from attending. 
Her laundry list of malicious acts as ringleader of the Gang of Four included public humiliation and even torture of Communist Party rivals, execution of her personal enemies. Inspiring the fear of the masses, and purging the arts of anything that did not carry a revolutionary theme. Zhang, while not denying many of these acts, insisted that she had all along acted at the behest of her husband, Mao. During the explosive testimony and presentation of evidence, which included tapes and documents, substantiating the state's case against Zhang, she made outbursts, was temporarily expelled from the courtroom, was dragged screaming from the courtroom twice, and even taunted her accusers into executing her, saying it would be more glorious to have my head chopped off. In the end Zhang and one other conspirator were found guilty and sentenced to death. Later commuted to life in prison. And the eight others were also found guilty and charged with sentences ranging from 16 years to life in prison. Zhang died on May 14, 1991 in what appeared to be a suicide. Was despotic Romanian leader Nicolae Ceausescu brought to justice? In the 1989 trial of Nicolae Ceausescu, 1918 to 1989 and his wife Elena 1919 to 1989 justice may not have been served but many believe the tyrannical communist leader of Romania had indeed met with just deserts the December 25th trial of the Ceausescu's lasted all of 60 minutes 55 minutes of questioning to which the president's response was. I do not recognize you, I do not recognize this court, followed by five minutes of deliberation. The court and judge were made up of the leaders in the popular rebellion that had begun December. 16 when a pro-democracy rally attended by some 350,000 people ended in the Romanian armies and Ceausescu's. Secret police attacking unarmed demonstrators, killing several hundred men, women, and children. In demonstrations that followed, the Romanian army. Long resentful of the privileged status enjoyed by the president's secret police, turned on Ceausescu's government. Handing over automatic weapons to insurgents, whom they now joined in a popular uprising. On December 21st state television and radio came under the people's control. As did the Communist Party's central building and the Royal Palace. Which were later found to be replete with luxuries and were also connected by a maze of tunnels. The Ceausescu's and a few of their close associates tried to flee but were captured on December 22 the same day that mass graves were found. Revealing the secret police's torture and destruction of several hundred men, women, and children. The rebels drove the Ceausescu's around for three days, averting the still loyal secret police. Realizing that time was not on their side. The captors assembled an extraordinary military tribunal in a small schoolroom at an army barracks. A defense lawyer was provided for Ceausescu, counsel urged the former president to plead. Guilty by reason of insanity. He refused. The charges against Ceausescu included genocide. 
the massacre of demonstrators, and subversion of the economy for his own benefit. One hour later, the guilty verdict was delivered. Asked if they wished to appeal the decision, the Ceausescus remained silent. They were promptly taken outside, where a squad opened fire on the former president and his wife. Videotape of the Brutal Killings The squad had fired as many as 30 rounds, was shown on Romanian television. By December 30 the country was controlled by rebel forces. Was despotic Romanian leader Nicolae Ceausescu brought to justice? In the 1989 trial of Nicolae Ceausescu, 1918-1989, and his wife Elena, 1919-1989, justice may not have been served. But many believe the tyrannical communist leader of Romania had indeed met with just deserts. The December 25th trial of the Ceausescus lasted all of 60 minutes. 55 minutes of questioning, to which the president's response was. I do not recognize you, I do not recognize this court, followed by five minutes of deliberation. The court and judge were made up of the leaders in the popular rebellion that had begun December. 16 when a pro-democracy rally attended by some 350,000 people ended in the Romanian armies and Ceausescu's. Secret police attacking unarmed demonstrators, killing several hundred men, women and children. In demonstrations that followed, the Romanian army. Long resentful of the privileged status enjoyed by the president's secret police, turned on Ceausescu's government. Handing over automatic weapons to insurgents, whom they now joined in a popular uprising. On December 21st state television and radio came under the people's control. As did the Communist Party's central building and the Royal Palace which were later found to be replete with luxuries and were also connected by a maze of tunnels. The Ceausescus and a few of their close associates tried to flee, but were captured on December 22 the same day that mass graves were found, revealing the secret police's torture and destruction of several hundred men, women and children. The rebels drove the Ceausescus around for three days, averting the still loyal secret police. Realizing that time was not on their side, the captors assembled an extraordinary military tribunal in a small schoolroom at an army barracks. A defense lawyer was provided for Ceausescu, counsel urged the former president to plead guilty by reason of insanity. He refused. The charges against Ceausescu included genocide, the massacre of demonstrators, and subversion of the economy for his own benefit. One hour later, the guilty verdict was delivered. Asked if they wished to appeal the decision, the Ceausescus remained silent. They were promptly taken outside, where a squad opened fire on the former president and his wife. Videotape of the Brutal Killings The squad had fired as many as 30 rounds, was shown on Romanian television. By December 30 the country was controlled by rebel forces.
What was the trial of the 20th century? As the century drew to a close, American historians, legal experts, and the public considered which of the many trials hailed as the trial of the 20th century actually was. But the criteria used by each person varied, some believed the most important trial was the most highly publicized. Others believed it was a trial in which the verdict affected everyone. Some thought it was a trial that most epitomized an era. And some believed the most important trial was the one that inspired the most public debate. Still others looked for a single trial that seemed to have it all. Notoriety, impact, reflections of society at large, and a controversial outcome. Among the courtroom dramas that were mentioned were, the 1907-1908 trial of Harry Thaw, 1871-1947, whose lawyers went through two trials, the first ended in a deadlock jury, to convince jurors that Mr. Thaw suffered from dementia Americans, a condition supposedly unique to American men. That had caused Thaw to experience an uncontrollable desire to kill a man who had had an affair with his wife. The case took innocent by reason of insanity to new heights. The well-to-do, Harvard-educated Thaw was declared not guilty. The 1921 case of Nicola Sacco, 1891-1927, and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, 1888-1927 Italian-born anarchists charged with and, amidst international uproar, found guilty of murder and robbery. So many people were convinced of the pair's innocence that demonstrations were mounted in cities around the world. They were executed in August 1927, but 50 years later Governor Michael Dukakis of Massachusetts signed a special proclamation clearing their names. The Bruno Richard Hauptmann, 1899-1936, trial of 1935. The German-born defendant was convicted of murdering the 20-month-old son of celebrated aviator Charles A. Lindbergh, 1902-1974, and his noted wife Anne Morrow Lindbergh, 1906-2001. After the child was kidnapped from the family's Hopewell, New Jersey. Home on March 1, 1932. For two and a half months, the world had prayed for the safe return of Charles Jr. But the toddler's body was found on May 12, two miles from the Lindbergh home. Public outrage. Demanded justice. Evidence surfaced that implicated Hauptmann. Who was tried January 2 to February 13, 1935. Found guilty, he died by electrocution. Influential journalist H. L. Mencken noted that the trial in which the conviction seemed to hinge on circumstantial evidence and which was attended by a circus-like atmosphere, was the biggest story since the resurrection. Though many remained convinced that officials had acted hastily to bring a case against Hauptmann and maintained that he'd been framed, efforts to clear his name continued to be denied into the 1990s. The 1931-1937 trials of the so-called Scottsboro Boys, nine men. Ranging in age from 12 to 20, who had been seized from several points along a 42-car train. 
in northeastern Alabama and were promptly charged with raping two white women. Upon medical examination, the women showed no signs of having been raped or even of having had intercourse in the time frame in question. Nevertheless, the court of public opinion in the segregated South saw to it that eight of the nine were convicted of the crime. In spite of overwhelming evidence and testimony supporting their innocence. The 1995 case of former football player O.J. Simpson, 1947, who was tried and acquitted in the murders of his former wife, Nicole, and her friend, Ronald Goldman. One observer said this trial had it all, women, minorities, public interest, domestic violence. Fallen hero, and through its live media coverage had exposed the legal system to the public. Other trials routinely mentioned in considering the question included the cases of convicted murderers Leopold and Loeb. The infamous Scopes Monkey Trial, which pitted faith against reason, religion against science, and tradition against modernity, the Nuremberg Trials which established a process that brought war criminals to justice, the case of Alger Hiss, who was either a traitor or the victim of a framing for political advantages at the highest levels, and the Rosenberg espionage case. Undoubtedly there are trials missing from even this long list. There can be no definitive answer to the question. What was the trial of the 20th century? As the century drew to a close, American historians, legal experts, and the public considered which of the many trials hailed as the trial of the 20th century actually was. But the criteria used by each person varied, some believed the most important trial was the most highly publicized. Others believed it was a trial in which the verdict affected everyone. Some thought it was a trial that most epitomized an era. And some believed the most important trial was the one that inspired the most public debate. Still others looked for a single trial that seemed to have it all. Notoriety, impact, reflections of society at large, and a controversial outcome. Among the courtroom dramas that were mentioned were, the 1907-1908 trial of Harry Thaw, 1871-1947. Whose lawyers went through two trials, the first ended in a deadlocked jury, to convince jurors that Mr. Thaw suffered from dementia Americans, a condition supposedly unique to American men. That had caused Thaw to experience an uncontrollable desire to kill a man who had had an affair with his wife. The case took innocent by reason of insanity to new heights. The well-to-do, Harvard-educated Thaw was declared not guilty. The 1921 case of Nicola Sacco, 1891-1927, and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, 1888-1927. Italian-born anarchists charged with and, amidst international uproar, found guilty of murder and robbery. So many people were convinced of the pair's innocence that demonstrations were mounted in cities around the world. They were executed in August 1927, but 50 years later Governor Michael 
Dukakis of Massachusetts signed a special proclamation clearing their names. The Bruno Richard Hauptmann, 1899 to 1936, trial of 1935. The German-born defendant was convicted of murdering the 20-month-old son of celebrated aviator Charles A. Lindbergh, 1902-1974, and his noted wife Anne Morrow Lindbergh, 1906-2001. After the child was kidnapped from the family's Hopewell, New Jersey. Home on March 1, 1932. For two and a half months, the world had prayed for the safe return of Charles Jr. But the toddler's body was found on May 12, two miles from the Lindbergh home. Public outrage. Demanded justice. Evidence surfaced that implicated Hauptmann. Who was tried January 2 to February 13, 1935. Found guilty, he died by electrocution. Influential journalist H. L. Mencken noted that the trial, in which the conviction seemed to hinge on circumstantial evidence and which was attended by a circus like atmosphere, was the biggest story since the resurrection. Though many remained convinced that officials had acted hastily to bring a case against Hauptmann and maintained that he'd been framed, efforts to clear his name continued to be denied into the 1990s. The 1931 to 1937 trials of the so-called Scottsboro Boys, nine men. Ranging in age from 12 to 20, who had been seized from several points along a 42-car train. In northeastern Alabama and were promptly charged with raping two white women. Upon medical examination, the women showed no signs of having been raped or even of having had intercourse in the time frame in question. Nevertheless, the court of public opinion in the segregated South saw to it that eight of the nine were convicted of the crime. In spite of overwhelming evidence and testimony supporting their innocence. The 1995 case of former football player O.J. Simpson, 1947. Who was tried and acquitted in the murders of his former wife, Nicole, and her friend, Ronald Goldman. One observer said this trial had it all, women, minorities, public interest, domestic violence. Fallen hero, and through its live media coverage had exposed the legal system to the public. Other trials routinely mentioned in considering the question included the cases of convicted murderers Leopold and Loeb. The infamous Scopes Monkey trial, which pitted faith against reason. Religion against science, and tradition against modernity, the Nuremberg Trials. Which established a process that brought war criminals to justice, the case of Alger Hiss, who was either a traitor or the victim. Of a framing for political advantages at the highest levels, and the Rosenberg espionage case. Undoubtedly there are trials missing from even this long list. There can be no definitive answer to the question. What were the sentences in the Beltway sniper cases? The October 2002 shootings that left 10 people dead and 3 critically injured in the Washington, D. C. area set off a flurry of legal activity, which was still underway three years later. 
two men had been found guilty by juries in separate trials in Virginia in late 2003, John Allen Muhammad. Born John Allen Williams 1960 was sentenced to death, and accomplice Lee Boyd Malvo. A.K.A. John Lee Malvo 1985 dash, received life imprisonment without parole. Since he was a minor at the time of the shooting spree, the death penalty could not be applied in his case. In October 2004, under a plea deal in two other Beltway sniper cases. Malvo received other sentences of life imprisonment without parole and eight years on gun charges. Muhammad and Malvo were arrested on October 24, 2002, in connection with the Beltway sniper attacks. The random shootings, which terrified suburban Washington and gripped the nation, began with a killing in a grocery store parking lot in Wheaton, Maryland, on the evening of October 2. Within the next 16 hours there were four more shootings and four more dead. By October 22 there were eight more sniper shootings, three of the victims survived. People were targeted as they went about their daily busyness, pumping fuel outside gas stations. Loading parcels into their cars in parking lots, arriving at school, and crossing streets. Tips led investigators to issue federal warrants for Muhammad's and Malvo's arrests on October 23, 2002. They were taken into custody early the following morning at a rest stop in Maryland. The two men faced charges in several states as well as the District of Columbia. In addition to Virginia and Maryland, the pair had been tied to crimes in the state of Washington. Where their journey had begun, as well as in Louisiana, Alabama, and Georgia. In 2005, with Malvo behind bars for life and Malvo awaiting a death sentence. Prosecutors still wanted the two tried in other cases, as insurance against reversals on appeals and as closure for the families of victims. But legal analysts questioned the high price of further trials, defense costs alone for Muhammad and Malvo, who received court-appointed, and publicly paid, defenders, were expected to near $1 million. The highly publicized sniper shootings added strength to the gun control lobby. According to federal law, neither Muhammad nor Malvo could buy firearms. The weapon they used in their deadly spree was shoplifted from a Tacoma, Washington, gun store. The store owner and the gun manufacturer were named in a civil suit by the legal action. Project of the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence on Behalf of the Victims and Their Families In 2004 a $2.5 million settlement was reached in the case. What were the sentences in the Beltway sniper cases? The October 2002 shootings that left 10 people dead and 3 critically injured in the Washington, D. C. area set off a flurry of legal activity, which was still underway three years later. Two men had been found guilty by juries in separate trials in Virginia in late 2003, John Allen Muhammad. Born John Allen Williams 1960- was sentenced to death, and accomplice Lee Boyd Malvo. A.K.A. John Lee Malvo 1985- received life imprisonment without parole. 
since he was a minor at the time of the shooting spree, the death penalty could not be applied in his case. In October 2004, under a plea deal in two other Beltway sniper cases. Malvo received other sentences of life imprisonment without parole and eight years on gun charges. Muhammad and Malvo were arrested on October 24, 2002, in connection with the Beltway sniper attacks. The random shootings, which terrified suburban Washington and gripped the nation, began with a killing in a grocery store parking lot in Wheaton, Maryland, on the evening of October 2. Within the next 16 hours there were four more shootings and four more dead. By October 22 there were eight more sniper shootings, three of the victims survived. People were targeted as they went about their daily busyness, pumping fuel outside gas stations. Loading parcels into their cars in parking lots, arriving at school, and crossing streets. Tips led investigators to issue federal warrants for Muhammad's and Malvo's arrests on October 23, 2002. They were taken into custody early the following morning at a rest stop in Maryland. The two men faced charges in several states as well as the District of Columbia. In addition to Virginia and Maryland, the pair had been tied to crimes in the state of Washington. Where their journey had begun, as well as in Louisiana, Alabama, and Georgia. In 2005, with Malvo behind bars for life and Malvo awaiting a death sentence. Prosecutors still wanted the two tried in other cases, as insurance against reversals on appeals and as closure for the families of victims. But legal analysts questioned the high price of further trials, defense costs alone for Muhammad and Malvo, who received court-appointed, and publicly paid, defenders, were expected to near $1 million. The highly publicized sniper shootings added strength to the gun control lobby. According to federal law, neither Muhammad nor Malvo could buy firearms. The weapon they used in their deadly spree was shoplifted from a Tacoma, Washington, gun store. The store owner and the gun manufacturer were named in a civil suit by the legal action. Project of the Brady Center to prevent gun violence on behalf of the victims and their families. In 2004 a $2.5 million settlement was reached in the case. Were any 9-11 conspirators convicted? Yes, but by 2005 there had been only one, French citizen Zacharias Moussaoui, 1968, was convicted in A.U.S. Court in Alexandria, Virginia. In connection with the September 11, 2001, attacks that claimed nearly 3,000 lives. Musawi was taken into custody by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. In August 2001, a flight instructor in Minnesota, where he was training, had reported him as suspicious. After the September terrorist attacks, Musawi continued to be held as the possible 20th hijacker. One of the flights on September 11 had four hijackers, the other three flights each had five. For the next three years, the suspected terrorist was the subject of a sometimes dramatic legal battle. 
Musawi insulted the U.S. district judge hearing his case. Attempted to fire his lawyers, and pleaded guilty only to later change his mind. On April 22, 2005, the case came to close when Musawi admitted his guilt in front of a packed courtroom. His sentencing trial was set for 2006. Were any 9-11th conspirators convicted? Yes, but by 2005 there had been only one, French citizen Zacharias Musawi, 1968, was convicted in AU. S. Court in Alexandria, Virginia. In connection with the September 11, 2001, attacks that claimed nearly 3,000 lives, Musawi was taken into custody by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. In August 2001, a flight instructor in Minnesota, where he was training, had reported him as suspicious. After the September terrorist attacks, Musawi continued to be held as the possible 20th hijacker. One of the flights on September 11th had four hijackers, the other three flights each had five. For the next three years, the suspected terrorist was the subject of a sometimes dramatic legal battle. Musawi insulted the U.S. district judge hearing his case. Attempted to fire his lawyers, and pleaded guilty only to later change his mind. On April 22, 2005, the case came to close when Musawi admitted his guilt in front of a packed courtroom. His sentencing trial was set for 2006. What is capitalism? The cornerstones of capitalism are private ownership of property, capital goods. Property and capital create income for those who own the property or capital. Individuals and firms openly compete with one another, with each seeking its own economic gain. So that competition determines prices, production, and distribution of goods and participants in the system are profit-driven, in other words, earning a profit is the main goal. Capitalism is the antithesis of socialism. A theory by which government owns most, if not all, of a nation's capital. There is no pure capitalist system. National governments become involved in the regulation of business to some degree. But the economy of the United States is highly capitalistic in nature. As are the economies of many other industrialized nations, including Great Britain. What is capitalism? The cornerstones of capitalism are private ownership of property, capital goods. Property and capital create income for those who own the property or capital. Individuals and firms openly compete with one another, with each seeking its own economic gain. So that competition determines prices, production, and distribution of goods. 
and participants in the system are profit driven, in other words, earning a profit is the main goal. Capitalism is the antithesis of socialism. A theory by which government owns most, if not all, of a nation's capital. There is no pure capitalist system. National governments become involved in the regulation of business to some degree. But the economy of the United States is highly capitalistic in nature. As are the economies of many other industrialized nations, including Great Britain. What does laissez-faire mean? From the French, laissez-faire literally means to let, people, do, as they choose. As an economic doctrine, laissez-faire opposes government interference in economic and business matters. Or at least desires to keep government's role to an absolute minimum. Laissez-faire favors a free market, a market characterized by open competition. The theory was popularized during the late 18th century as a reaction to mercantilism. Noted Scottish economist Adam Smith, 1723 to 1790, was among the advocates of a laissez-faire market. What does laissez-faire mean? From the French, laissez-faire literally means to let, people, do, as they choose. As an economic doctrine, laissez-faire opposes government interference in economic and business matters. Or at least desires to keep government's role to an absolute minimum. Laissez-faire favors a free market, a market characterized by open competition. The theory was popularized during the late 18th century as a reaction to mercantilism. Noted Scottish economist Adam Smith, 1723 to 1790, was among the advocates of a laissez-faire market. Citizens were encouraged to build bomb shelters. School children participated in air raid drills. Civil defense films, such as How Can I Stay Alive in an Atom Bomb Blast? Were screened, and entire towns conducted tests of how residents would respond in the event of an A bomb. Meantime, the leak of top-secret information from the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, New Mexico was traced to New York City machine shop owner Julius Rosenberg, his wife, and her brother, David Greenglass. Historian Doris Kearns Goodwin writes that the short, plump MRS. Rosenberg looked more like one of my friend's mothers than an international spy. Indeed, the case marked the first time American civilians were charged with espionage. And the trial made international headlines. Though the Rosenbergs were only two of many involved in the conspiracy. Theirs was the heaviest of the punishments handed down in the cases against the spy ring. For their betrayal and their refusal to talk, the Rosenbergs were sentenced to death. In issuing the sentence, 
Judge Irving Kaufman accused the couple of having altered the course of history. The penalty rocked the world, as Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter put it. They were tried for conspiracy and sentenced for treason. They were electrocuted the evening of June 19, 1953, as new. York's Union Square filled with an estimated 10,000 protesters. What were the Jim Crow laws? They were laws or practices that segregated blacks from whites. They prevailed in the American South during the late 1800s and into the first half of the 1900s. Jim Crow was a stereotype of a black man described in a 19th century song and dance act. The first written appearance of the term is dated 1838. And by the 1880s it had fallen into common usage in the United States. Even though in 1868 Congress passed the 14th Amendment, prohibiting states from violating equal protection of all citizens. Southern states passed many laws segregating blacks from whites in public places. In short, the laws were both manifestation and enforcement of discrimination. Thanks to the Civil Rights Movement. The laws were finally found to be unconstitutional during the 1950s and 1960s. What was the Supreme Court's role in racial segregation? Though most segregation laws, or Jim Crow laws, were overturned by decisions of the Supreme Court during the 1950s and 1960s, the court was righting its own wrong, in the late 1800s. During the years following the Civil War, 1861-65, and the abolition of slavery, the Supreme Court made rulings that actually supported segregation laws at the state level. The most famous of these was the 1896 case of Plessy v. Ferguson, in which the highest court in the land upheld the constitutionality of Louisiana's law requiring separate but equal facilities for whites and blacks in railroad cars. One strong dissenting opinion came from Associate Justice John Marshall Harlan, who declared the Constitution is color blind. Following the Plessy v. Ferguson decision, states went on to use the separate but equal principle for 50 years, passing Jim Crow laws that set up racial segregation in public schools. Transportation, and in recreation, sleeping, and eating facilities. This meant there were drinking fountains, benches, restrooms, bus seats, hospital beds, and theater sections designated as whites only or colored. One Arkansas law even provided that witnesses being sworn in to testify in a courtroom be given different Bibles depending on the color of their skin. Two landmark Supreme Court decisions came in 1954 and 1960 in the cases of Brown v. The Board of Education and Boynton v. Virginia. In the first case, parents of black children in Topeka, Kansas, Elementary schools charged that the segregation of white and black students in the 
public schools denied black children the equal protection cited in the 14th Amendment, 1868. The parents were supported in their fight by the NAACP. National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, whose legal counsel included Thurgood Marshall, 1908-1993. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that segregated schools do violate the Equal Protection Clause. Overturning the separate but equal doctrine previously upheld by Plessy v. Ferguson. The federal government again made a stand against state segregation laws when, in December 1960, Chief Appellant Lawyer Thurgood Marshall argued the case of Howard University law student Bruce Boynton before the Supreme Court. Again ruling in favor of the plaintiff, who had charged that the segregation laws at the Richmond, Virginia, bus station violated the federal anti-segregation laws. Washington sent a clear message to the states that public facilities are for the use of all citizens, regardless of color. These decisions combined with the activism of the civil rights movement to outlaw racial segregation. What is the Miranda warning? Familiar to many Americans from TV police dramas. The Miranda warning is a reading of the arrested person's rights, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court. You have a right to consult with a lawyer, if you cannot afford a lawyer. One will be appointed for you. Reading the defendant his rights became a requirement. After the 1963 trial of Ecobedo Miranda, a Mexican, who was accused of rape. He was found guilty and sentenced to 20 to 30 years imprisonment. But Alvin Moore, Miranda's court-appointed lawyer, had revealed through his questioning of a police officer that the defendant had not been notified of his right to the services of an attorney. The same police officer had taken Miranda's written confession following two hours of interrogation. Moore, convinced that the confession should not have been admissible in court because of the procedural error of not informing the defendant of his rights, appealed the Miranda case all the way to the Supreme Court. On June 13, 1966, the High Court ruled, in a 5-4 decision, that Moore was right. Chief Justice Earl Warren, 1891-1974, reasserted that prior to any questioning a person must be warned that he has a right to remain silent. That any statement he does make may be used as evidence against him, and that he has the right to, an attorney. Miranda's first trial was thrown out, and in 1967 he again stood trial in Arizona. But the prosecution secured new evidence. The testimonial of his estranged girlfriend that Miranda had confessed to her the rape he was charged with. He was convicted and again sentenced to 20 to 30 years in prison. Released on parole, Miranda died in a bar fight in January 1976. But police officers, the courts, and defendants still remember the importance of the case even if they can't recall Miranda's name or crime. Why is the ruling in Roe v.
What were carpetbaggers? Carpetbaggers was a derisive term that referred to northerners who arrived in the south in the early days of reconstruction. 1865 to 77, the 12 year period of rebuilding that followed the American Civil War, 1861 to 65. Even though many of these northern businessmen intended to settle in the south, southerners viewed them as outsiders and Worse, as opportunists who only intended to make a quick profit before returning north. They were called carpetbaggers because many carried carpetbags as luggage. Some southerners even quipped that these northerners could carry all their belongings in a carpetbag. Implying that they were nothing more than transients. Nevertheless, Northerners who relocated to the South following. The Civil War played an important role during Reconstruction. Some, aided by the black vote, gained public office and impacted state and local policy. But others proved to be corrupt. Because of the latter. The term carpetbagger became synonymous with a meddling, opportunistic outsider. What are blue laws? The term blue laws refers to laws that are intended to enforce moral conduct. They originated in colonial times in Puritan New England. And got the name because they were printed on blue paper. Some blue laws prescribed proper conduct for the Sabbath, which included no working, sports, or drinking. The early blue laws of New Haven, Connecticut were widely publicized in a 1781 book, A General History of Connecticut. The author, Samuel Peters, 1735-1826, took some freedoms with the text. However, and even invented a few laws of his own. Since blue laws violate individual freedoms, most of them have been repealed through the years. If a community still has blue laws on its books today, they are not likely to be enforced. James Iredell Jay's was an impressive resume by the time of his appointment, he had been a member of the Continental Congress, over which he presided as president in 1778 and 1779, served as U.S. Minister to Spain. 1779, during the American Revolution, and joined American statesman Benjamin Franklin. 1706-1790, and the rest of the American Peace Commission in Paris, in 1782, to draw up the treaty ending the war with Britain. Once the new republic was established, Jay remained at the fore. He became President Washington's Secretary of Foreign Affairs, 1784-89, and, along with Alexander Hamilton, 1755-1804, and James Madison, 1751-1836, authored The Federalist, 1787 to 88 which explained the constitution for the benefit of the states as they considered ratification weight controversial
the 1973 Supreme Court decision in the case of Roe v. Wade legalized abortion in the United States and has probably engendered more public controversy than any other legal decision of the late 20th century. Women's access to safe abortion continues to be the subject of debate. At issue in legal cases, and has inspired overzealous anti-abortion activists to violence. Against doctors who perform abortions and office workers in women's health clinics. The seven Supreme Court justices who issued the majority decision became the recipients of thousands of letters of hatred, some of them threatening. The case was brought as a class action suit, representing all pregnant women. By 21 year old Norma McCorvey, 1947, who has since the ruling reversed her feeling and joined the anti abortion camp as a right to life advocate. But in 1969, under the alias Jane Roe, McCorvey claimed that Texas's abortion law on the books since 1859, violated her constitutional rights and those of other women. The other party named in the case was Texas District Attorney Henry B. Wade, 1914 to 2001 who argued to uphold Texas state law that punished anyone who gave an abortion. Despite the fact that the ruling in the case would do nothing to help McCorvey. For whom even a favorable decision would come too late to end her unwanted pregnancy, her lawyers, Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington. Agreed to pursue the case as a test. The crux of the plaintiff's case is best summed up by arguments made before the Supreme Court, when in December 1971. Weddington argued that Texas's ability to compel women to bear children infringed on a woman's right to control her own life. It was therefore a violation of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment which forbids states to make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens. In response to defense claims that the fetus is entitled to protection, Weddington averred. The Constitution as I read it, attaches protection to the person at the time of birth. These arguments, and those of the defense, were presented twice to the Supreme Court. After the first presentation the seven justices then seated concluded that such an important decision should not be made until the two newly appointed justices could participate. In October 1972 the case was heard again. As it turned out, the two new judges represented one majority vote and one dissenting vote. The majority decision was read by Justice Harry Blackman on January 22, 1973. The High Court overturned all state laws restricting women's access to abortions. The decision was based on the court's opinion that existing laws banning abortions had been enacted to protect the health of American women, since abortion had previously been a risky medical procedure. And that with advances in medicine this protection was no longer necessary or valid. The court also agreed that the Constitution's implied right to privacy. As found in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty, or in the 9th Amendment's reservation of rights to the people is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision to terminate her pregnancy. Two justices dissented in the opinion, with Justice Byron White writing that 
the court had sustained a position that values the convenience. Whim or caprice of the putative mother more than life or the potential life of the fetus. Nearly three decades after the landmark decision, opinion continues to divide along such lines. What was Operation Falcon? It was the code name for the mid-April 2005 roundup of more than 10,000 fugitives in one week. The coordinated nationwide effort was led by the U.S. Marshal Service. Together with officers from 960 federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. The marshals arrested 10,340 people who were wanted for various crimes, many of them violent. The operation took place during Crime Victims' Rights Week. More than 150 of the fugitives were wanted for murder. 550 for sexual assault charges, and more than 600 for armed robberies. There were also escaped prisoners and criminal suspects among those arrested. Operation Falcon was a landmark in law enforcement because of the sheer number of arrests. Previous coordinated efforts had nabbed only hundreds of fugitives. Why does the President of the United States give a State of the Union address? The U.S. Constitution requires the President to annually present a joint session of Congress. Attended by representatives and senators, with a status report on the nation. Presidents George Washington, 1732-1799, and John Adams, 1735-1826. The first and second presidents, delivered their messages in person. Thereafter the State of the Union was sent as a written message, which was read in Congress. But President Woodrow Wilson, 1856 to 1924, delivered his messages in person. Including that of January 1918, when he delivered the 14 points his formulation of a peace program for Europe once World War I. 1914 to 18, had ended. Since Franklin D. Roosevelt. 1882 to 1945, held office, beginning in 1933, all U.S. presidents have made formal addresses to Congress. Who was John Peter Zenger? John Peter Zenger 1697 to 1746 was a New York City printer who was accused of seditious libel in 1735. His case changed the definition of libel in American courtrooms and laid the foundation for freedom of the press. The German-born Zenger immigrated to the American colonies in 1710 when he was 13 years old. He found a job as a printer's apprentice, working on the colony's official newspaper, the New York Gazette. Fifteen years later he began his own operation, which was mostly concerned with printing religious pamphlets. 
In 1733 New York received a new colonial governor from England. William Cosby quickly earned the contempt of the colonists, both rich and poor. Prosperous businessmen who opposed Cosby and his grievous tactics approached Zenger. Offering to back a newspaper that he would both edit and publish. Zenger agreed and on November 5, 1733, the first issue of the weekly journal was released. It included scathing criticisms of the royal governor, raising Cosby's ire. After burning several issues of the papers, Cosby had Zenger arrested in November 1734. The editor publisher continued to operate the journal from inside his jail cell, dictating editorials to his wife through the door. Zenger's case went to trial in August 1735. Prominent Philadelphia attorney Andrew Hamilton. 1676 to 1741, considered the best lawyer in the colonies, came to Zenger's defense. Hamilton admitted his client was guilty of publishing the papers, but, he argued, that in order for libel to be proved, Zenger's statements had to be both false and malicious. The prosecution contested the definition of libel, asserting that libelous statements are any words that are scandalous, seditious, and tend to disquiet the people. The court agreed with the prosecution, and Hamilton was therefore unable to bring forth any evidence to support the truth of the materials and are printed in the weekly journal. The defense argument was not heard until the closing statement was made by Hamilton. His summation stands as one of the most famous in legal history. He accused the court of suppressing evidence, urging the jury to consider the court's actions as the strongest evidence. And went on to declare that liberty is the people's only bulwark against lawless power. Men who injure and oppress the people under their administration provoke them to cry out and complain. The brilliant attorney closed by urging the gentlemen of the jury to take up the cause of liberty. Telling them that by so doing, they will have baffled the attempt of tyranny. The seven jury members were convinced by Hamilton's impassioned speech and found Zenger not guilty. Discharged from prison the next day, Zenger returned to his printing business. Publishing the transcripts of his own trial. While colonial officials were reluctant to accept the case's ruling on the definition of libel. The case became famous throughout the American colonies. And once the colonists had thrown off England's royal rule and established a new republic, the nation's founding fathers codified the Zenger trial's ruling in the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees freedom of press.